All right, everybody, we're about 15 minutes till start. And I just wanted to uh, just give a quick sound check to everybody. Uh, make sure that everything is going well and uh, that uh, screen is visible. Uh, so if we could just get a hand raise or something from somebody out there just to make sure that we're broadcasting well. It is the third Thursday webinar from Environmental Express. My name is David, and today we're going to be talking about oil and grease. Um, oil and grease extractions made easy, I guess, is our official title. And our primary focus is going to be solid phase extraction. So we've done some in the past talking about oil and grease um, in general, um, but today we're going to talk focus mostly on solid phase extraction, kind of what it is, how it works, and I'm going to give a brief introduction of our um, newly redesigned uh, step saver apparatus, so the um, manifold to do um, some oil, uh, solid phase extractions. And then at the end, I've already got some uh, troubleshooting type questions that um, I've gathered from our um, talk to our tech team here, got uh, some of the more commonly asked things, uh, some of the common ailments that people tend to come across, and some ideas on how to troubleshoot them, how to solve them. Uh, these are, again, going to be focused on solid space extraction. Some of these ideas may be um, applicable to liquid liquid extraction as well but i'm not making any promises on that so without further ado our first blank slide woo what is oil and grease and that's something if you say the words people kind of have an idea you you got this mental image of what it is uh, these are probably the two easiest ones to talk about and to define uh, unfortunately, oils and greases are don't fit into a really good chemical definition. <clears throat> you can't uh, really define them as far as molecular structure. Um, you may be able to do some interesting reactions or something to define them, but for your simple analytical stuff, it's <clears throat> there's n it's really hard to distinguish them just because they're such a wide variety of uh, molecules that they could fall into. And so what we've done is uh, the EPA has come up with uh, a method-defined analyte um, or a procedure that makes it a method-defined analyte. Um, to be most technical, it is actually HEM, hexane extractable material, not oil and grease. Um, hexane extractable material because hexane is the solvent of choice that we're using. And <clears throat> Hexane is, it will dissolve everything that you think of as being oil and grease, but it will also get a few other things as well. Most notable is elemental sulfur. So if you're in, I believe, the Pacific Northwest or the Florida Peninsula, uh, then there's some significant sulfur in your water and you can extract sulfur um, using hexane. So there are uh, some potential um, positive interferences there. Um, because it is a method-defined analyte, there are very limited options for doing method modifications. You have to do this method almost exactly as written. Um, the, the, any modifications that are used <clears throat> cannot alter the chemistry of the method, specifically the choice of solvents. That is the most uh, strict um, portion of this method, I would venture to say, uh, you cannot use any other solvent for your elution, and you cannot do, uh, you cannot introduce any other solvents to do what they've defined or called a co-solvent elution, um, meaning uh, you can't have anything else mixed in with your hexane, uh, because that would modify what is and is not soluble in that mixture. Any modifications that fall within the allowable structure cannot adversely affect AGM recoveries. Uh, you can demonstrate an improvement in your recoveries, but if there is anything uh, that detracts from what you, you get um, as written, then you cannot use it. 
And this process is essentially a semi-volatile extraction. Uh, you are removing um, components uh, from a liquid, and I guess it's adaptable to solids. I've never seen anybody do oil and grease on solids, but um, you're, you're extracting these, these molecules out of a aqueous medium and you're transferring it over to a solvent. <clears throat> the big difference there is that instead of um, actually going over to your fun advanced analytical instrumentation and actually finding out all the different components of your extract, you are just doing a gravimetric analysis where you evaporate the hexane off and all you do is measure the mass of what has been extracted. But if you if you think about this as being your, your semi-volatile extraction, you'll see a lot of um, analogous uh, techniques and procedures and, and the way things are done. Um, solid phase extraction, in, in reference to uh, HEM, to oil and grease, it was allowed in revision A of method 1664, and it specifically says you do not need to demonstrate any kind of equivalency. You can just use solid phase extraction uh, with just your normal uh, method startup stuff, your IDOCs, your, your limits of detection, you know, all the uh, MDLs, all that normal stuff. The way it works is you're utilizing an extraction disk, um, or I guess you could just do uh, just a bed of the extraction resin, depending on the format of how you're putting it together. But you've, you've got um, uh, a C C18 as the, um, oops, and typo there, not absorbent, adsorbent resin. Uh, that B should be a D, um, and the C18 is the is what makes the magic happen here. Um, most discs that you get, or most resins that you ha get, have to be activated with a polar solvent prior to use, and typically, that solvent that gets used is methanol. Now, why that's important to know that this is being used is because of that co-solvent dilution that we talked about earlier. You have to make sure that none of your activating solvent is present still to um, elute the analytes off of the disk. Uh, so that basically requires, um, once the disk has been activated with methanol, that you um, wash the methanol off the disk with DI water, with just reagent water. And once that resin has been activated, as long as it stays damp with some kind of liquid, it is still good to go. So replacing the methanol with DI water is fine. And then you have DI water on it, and then you can continue extracting with your, with your resin. Um, there is another option, and that is to use a resin that does not require pre-activation. Uh, Environmental Express, as far as I know, um, is the only uh, one who offers um, this type of resin for use in in this in this area. Um, there may be others that have come up since um, I last looked, um, but uh, the last time I checked, we were the only ones who had that option available. Um, and basically, it, what it does is it allows you to skip that methanol pre-activation step, uh, which can be somewhat tricky for some labs for some analysts. And so just that peace of mind of um, being able to skip that can be very helpful for some people. And the, the general process is you're just pulling your sample through the disk with vacuum. Uh, HEM and or yeah, HEM is retained on the disk. Um, it's, it's attracted to that uh, C18 resin. And then you elute with hexane, collect that hexane in a pre-weighed pan or dish. And then you do your evaporation and weighing uh, the same as you would normally with, uh, with LLE, with liquid liquid extraction. Just some comparisons, liquid liquid versus solid phase extractions. Liquid liquid, you have a physical mixing of your solvent in aqueous phases. And then those two separate based on miscibility. Uh, aqueous solutions and hexane do not mix. And so after you've shaken them up together and let them set, uh, sit, they will separate out. And then basically you're, you end up with a two-step draining process because hexane floats on water. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say before anybody starts to get concerned, those pictures there are not oil and grease extractions. Um, I didn't have any good pictures that showed a nice definite layer from oil and grease, so I used a, um, 
I believe that's our uh, color-coded surrogates, just to give you a good color visual of, of what the layers would look like. But essentially, those two layers would be reversed from what you see there. The, the sample, um, which is often colored, is going to be on the bottom. The aqueous layer is heavier than hexane. So you have to drain that aqueous layer off first, retain it, then keep your then drain your hexane off and collect it in your collection flask or pan or whatever. Put your aqueous uh, portion back in the um, separation funnel and add in your fresh layer of hexane to do your second and third extractions. Uh, one of the big problems with uh, liquid liquid is that you have a, a strong probability of forming emulsions, uh, which can then be difficult to um, proceed afterwards, uh, letting those emulsions separate out, collapsing them somehow. Um, there's various techniques. Some are more effective in certain cases than others. I don't think any of them are ever 100% effective in over all cases. Um, but there you are. And liquid liquid can be somewhat reliant on your shaking technique. Um, the, the length of time, the vigorousness with which you shake, um, all of that will go into the effectiveness of your extraction. Solid phase extraction uh, in comparison or contrast to that then, it's a filtration style. I had filtration in quotes because it's not really filtration, which usually just operates on uh, particle size. Um, it is an adsorption. It's, it's a chemical um, separation. But it's a two-stage extraction. So you have your sample going through that disk. And then all of your analyte uh, is on the disk, and then you apply hexane to it. And again, you're using three rinses of hexane, uh, the same as you do with liquid liquid. Um, however, you can often get away with using less hexane, probably a third or so of what you would normally use in liquid liquid. You don't have any contact between your solvent and your aqueous phase. That eliminates the possibility of that emulsion forming. Um, also, any of you who have ever done any uh, liquid liquid extraction in a separatory funnel know about your vapor buildup and how that can uh, have caused some potential problems if you don't vent often enough. And that is primarily with your solvent and, and aqueous uh, interaction going on there. That doesn't happen with solid phase. Uh, one of the big problems with solid phase extraction is you've got the potential of the disk being physically blocked um, from particulates that are present in your sample. So as you are trying to um, pull that sample through the disk, if there are enough particulates, then that disk will clog up and not allow any more sample to pass through. Uh, however, solid phase extraction generally is independent of the analyst technique. Um, if they, you know, there is no real variable process that you can do. Uh, the one potential exception there, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is with the um, activation of the disk. That can um, vary from analyst to analyst how that gets done, and so that can have some effect from one analyst to another. Some important things to remember and know about solid phase extraction. The disk, the resin that you use, is not generally analyte specific. Um, we'll talk about that more in, in the bottom bullet point. C18. Uh, which is what's generally used, will absorb, absorb all sorts of things, from a, including HEM. So you've got antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, surfactants, vitamins, personal care products, all kinds of things that actually get absorbed onto that disc. Um, so the actual selectivity of the technique comes from the solvent that you use, and that's why that uh, mandate on no co-solvent um, elutions is so important. Uh, you have to use hexane because it is hexane extractable material. Anything that dissolves in hexane is counted in this test, and so you must use hexane and only hexane so that you don't affect anything else being uh, dissolved and eluded out. Uh, the, the resin, the disc, the resin that we put on our disc does have an upper limit on the extraction capacity. What that limit is is kind of up for debate. So to explain what, how, what that means, the 47 millimeter disc, which is what you see pictured here, there is enough resin there to extract 1,000 milligrams of your uh, standard as it's defined in the method. So if you take a 50-50 mixture of hexadecane and stearic acid 
and you make a thousand milligram per liter solution uh, and extract a liter of that, then you will get adequate recovery off of the disk if from just a user made uh, standard. Now, what we don't know is how that pertains to real world samples. Remember, the C18 will pull all sorts of things out of your aqueous uh, phase. Uh, how preferential C18 is for one of those analytes over another is unknown, or at least I is unknown to me. There may be some uh, real cool studies out there. Somebody's uh, PhD thesis that's uh, investigated that. I don't have that information. Um, and so whether it's all done just first come first serve basis however whatever order those analytes happen to get to the disk or whether there are certain ones um, it's hard to say and so with your actual environmental sample that has all sorts of things in addition to HEM it is there there's a real potential for um, those things to uh, take the place of HEM on the disk if they are present in high enough quantities. And so you may not get full extraction of your HEM if there are significant amounts of any of these other things present. Uh, there are different ways to address that. Um, basically, the you, you have to know uh, your sample, and that usually requires some other analyses being done to see if these things are present before you can do anything to address them. Um, manual FBE manifold. So here we see um, pictures of on the left is the original version of our step saver. And then on the right is a picture of the new version of our step saver. My intent, I wanted to be able to actually have a kind of a live demonstration of the new step saver to kind of show you all the different pieces and parts. Um, unfortunately, the um, webinar broadcast of live video kind of precludes uh, being able to do that in uh, in a manner that would work for everybody. Um, it's it's just not something that um, this is set up to do well. Um, you wouldn't just get you wouldn't get all the details. So we're just going to have to settle for our picture here, and I'm going to blow that up so it's a little easier to look at. Um, what we've done is we've replaced um, all the glassware that you previously saw and used with um, plastic pieces. Uh, this is PVC and I think uh, polycarbonate, I think is, uh, so the, all the gray pieces are PVC and I believe the clear uh, sheaths there are polycarbonate. Uh, they do not react to hexane, so they're, they're safe. They won't degrade uh, just from solvent being spilled on them because we all know that solvent does get spilled. And um, how this works, let me pull my pointer out here so I can highlight things. So this up here should be familiar to many of you who have used our step saver before. That is a 300 milliliter uh, disposable funnel, uh, which is this piece up here. And then down here, uh, the base is attached to a housing that has our extraction disc in it already. Um, so what would happen? is you put the, the funnel with the disc here, and, and both of these tops are essentially the same. There's just this little raised piece that the funnel base sits around. Um, that goes attached on there, and vacuum is applied through this barb down here on the manifold. Open the stopcock here, and this is basically just a large bell jar. There's a uh, large opening down at the bottom of this. It's uh, cupped down so that everything slopes down in and you pour your sample in through the funnel and the vacuum draws the sample. I'm gesturing with my hands which you can't see so I'm going to use my uh, spotlight. Uh, vacuum draws the sample down through here. It all goes down into the waste through here, pulls out through this channel and this gets drawn off down through here through vacuum tubing and goes to a carboy to be collected in the way. So you'd have a carboy down here um, in line in between your vacuum source and this manifold. Uh, the activation, or if you're using pre-activated, that would be done here as well. Um, usually your methanol solvents, um, uh, they'll be collected there in your aqueous waste. Um, that would, of course, 
you know, you'd, you'd need to se segregate this waste then as being um, solvent, uh, having solvent uh, in it as well. So that does generate that waste stream, but that's the same as uh, any waste stream that you'd be generating uh, previously anyway. We also do have the option of, uh, we will continue to have the um, uh, large one liter glass funnels, uh, which will be available to use there. So if you want to use those, th those are perfectly fine to use. We won't have the um, housing with the disc um, that attaches onto it. Uh, you would use the um, the same uh, gasket with screen, uh, with the, the, the stainless steel screen underneath it uh, that we've got with the previous one. So uh, let me back up real quick with, um, I talked about the original version of the Step Saver. We will no longer um, be selling that as a complete unit. Um, we will still have replacement parts. So those of you who um, are using that and something breaks, uh, we will still be able to supply replacement parts and pieces for that. that don't, don't worry about that. We, we are going to support you. Um, but going forward uh, with new units, we will not um, have complete systems for the new units available. Uh, we will be going with this style only. Uh, so once this, uh, the initial aqueous um, extraction is done and you have all your analytes collected on the disk, you will move this entire disk over to this station. So the top stays in place and then just the disk and the funnel get picked up and moved over here and then placed in place over here. Uh, you can see that this top um, right here hanging down is the sodium sulfate extraction cartridge that we've uh, been using. It's the exact same style that uh, goes on our current step saver. Uh, there is a little lure connector um, on the bottom side of this piece. So you just screw that on and then the funnel attaches here and then you do your extraction with hexane from there. Uh, so the hexane will um, be added onto the disc, uh, rinse out your bottle with it here, uh, pour that hexane onto the disc, and then close this stopcock, open this stopcock up. And we've got a couple of options for collection on this side. It will uh, hold our, um, just that same uh, round bottom, I guess actually it's a flat round bottom flask uh, that we've got um, to collect your, your hexane extract in. You can collect it in the uh, pans uh, that we currently use. Um, in that case, you may actually prefer to swap uh, the, um, the outer shells here and use the taller one on your um, aqueous side and the shorter one on your hexane side just to uh, minimize the amount of splashing that may happen. Uh, that They are perfectly interchangeable in that manner. That's, that's not a problem. And we have also explored the possibility of using these stable way vessels uh, for a collection and um, going that way. Um, we've encountered a few technical difficulties working with that, mainly in the speed of evaporation. Uh, because the amount of hexane collected is so small um, and the vessels themselves are quite tall in comparison, uh, evaporation is a lot slower. Uh, so we're, we're looking at ways to do that, um, but we think uh, there, there may be some possibilities in using that. If nothing else, you can use some of them as the collection flask and then pour out into another smaller um, evaporation pan or something along those lines, uh, just to continue uh, using them in that way. But uh, the goal here was to make it a lot simpler as far as um, possibility of breaking and eliminating potential leaks in the system. Uh, there are no uh, stopcocks to have to turn one way or the other. There's uh, no um, worries about uh, glass junctions and uh, vacuum pulling too strongly one way or another. Um, I know we, we had experienced um, some issues with some stopcocks not being um, the best seal and having some leak around those. And so going to this particular setup has removed all of those particular um, problems. And one thing that uh, we do need to make you aware of is that uh, Space-wise, um, so these only come as single uh, stations, and uh, they do take up a little bit more space than 
the compact style uh, available from the um, glass setup. Uh, this particular uh, setup, let me see if I can back it up just a little bit. Um, uh, there we go. So to, for size comparison, this is a this three PlayStation that you're looking at here is just a little bit wider uh, from side to side than this single PlayStation here. So it does take up a little bit more space. Um, however, with the size, um, the, the height, uh, they're not quite as tall. So it's a little bit easier to stack them up uh, front to back on your desktop or on your bench top. Um, as well. So you lose a little bit of space, but it, uh, we do believe the uh, functionality more than makes up for uh, losing that space. All right, so we're going to go over to the troubleshooting of um, Liquid Liquid, and um, we'll, let's see here, let me, uh, we've got three basic um, categories of uh, the troubles that um, come up during uh, solid phase extraction, high recovery of your standard, low recovery of your standard, and the disc clogging. And I'm going to address them, I think, in a slightly different order than what I've got listed. Um, and we'll talk about a few things, how to address them, and, and what you can do with them. High recovery is almost always related to water issues. Uh, usually, it's uh, the fact that you've got more water um, in your uh, bottle or entrained on the disc or something than uh, your sodium sulfate is capable of removing. Um, and oftentimes, if it, that's the case, then you actually have dissolved some sodium sulfate in the water itself, and that comes out <clears throat> then with your hexane extract. And then once everything evaporates, uh, you're left with sodium sulfate dissolved or deposited in your uh, pan or, or, or flask along with your HEM. Um, also, potentially, you could have sodium sulfate fines uh, if you are using a, um, uh, a, a funnel with a, um, a, a disc, a filter disc that you've uh, you know folded up into your nice funnel shape. Uh, put your sodium sulfate in there and poured your extract over top of that to dry it. Um, if you have um, non-uniform sodium sulfate, you could potentially have some small small particles that actually go through that uh, filter disc and get uh, collected in your flask as well. So that's something you can watch out for. Um, if you suspect that that's the case, then you can add more hexane to the flask that you've uh, collected everything in. Um, stir it up a little bit to dissolve things, and that will then leave your sodium sulfate behind. Uh, it, it does not dissolve in the hexane itself, and since you're not introducing any more water, um, it won't get carried through. So then you would just pour that uh, hexane out into another flask, leaving any um, particulates behind that are not hexane soluble, and that will help you then to uh, clear that up. Um, as far as addressing the amount of water that uh, comes through your extraction disc, um, careful, paying careful attention initially when you're uh, filtering the water out or filtering the, the, the aqueous sample through the disc, um, it uh, that you know just making sure you get all the last bits of water out that you can, um, and then also drying the disc after you're done with that initial um, extraction phase. Uh, drying the disc can be a big help. There are a couple of techniques. Um, the easiest one to do is to simply allow vacuum to pull on the disc uh, for a longer period of time after the water is all gone. Um, and that will help to kind of vacuum dry the disc out, uh, remove any water particulates, water droplets that may be hanging on in that disc, um, and pull that out. Uh, you can speed that up by adding acetone to the disc. Um, that is something that uh, Method 1664 addresses. Um, it is acceptable to do if you are able to demonstrate that after adding it, 
you whatever steps you take, which usually is to again just continue to pull vacuum, adequately remove any of that um, solvent, uh, acetone. Some people use methanol. Um, if you're adequately removing it from the disc prior to then eluding with hexane. Uh, the method gives an example of how to demonstrate this. It involves taking an unused extraction disc um, and setting it up in the apparatus, pouring whatever uh, defined amount of methanol or acetone on the disc, um, whatever you've got written in your SOP. And this is one case where you do have to be very specific as far as how much you add. Um, and then doing the drying process after that Reweighing this disc, so you haven't extracted anything on it, you just put your solvent through it, and then showing that all of the solvent that was added is gone by virtue of the disc weighing the same as it did before you started using it. And so you would then have to keep all those records on hand um, along with your SOP or something to show that your uh, technique is adequate. Um, that's kind of long and involved, and it sometimes I, it, it's been difficult to uh, show that adequately so that if, if you can make that happen great otherwise you may just need to uh, use an extended um, vacuum drying process on your water. The disc clogging uh, issues is usually going to be sample dependent. Um, it's very difficult to pre-evaluate that um, with just by looking at the sample. Some things that you think may be terrible could actually flow quite easily and some things that look like they're not going to be a problem at all will clog up uh, with hardly any sample being filtered at all. Um, it's, it's all just going to depend on the type of particulate and, and how it goes. Clays versus silt versus polymers versus actual uh, you know, pieces of paper or whatever, all of those grass leaves, everything's, everything's going to behave differently. So you're going to have to evaluate the best way to do it. It may require um, multiple disks. Uh, one method that I've often suggested to people is if you know that a sample is going to give you a problem, um, only uh, do the uh, extraction on a portion of the sample at a time. And so you would extract some of it and then do the elution on that disk and collect your hexane and then replace the disc, get a new one, and then extract and elute more of the sample. And as long as you continue collecting in the same receiving flask at the end, that is still going to be fine. You will not, uh, you'll, you'll get complete recovery from your sample and you'll be able to minimize the amount of problems that you have with the collect, with the, uh, the, the filtration portion. You do have the option of collecting a smaller volume of sample uh, in this case. Just remember that if you do collect a smaller volume of sample, that you must run your QC, uh, your batch QC, at that same volume. So you can't have different volumes of sample from different samples run in the same batch. If you collect one sample at 250 mils and all the rest of them at one liter, you will have to have two different batches. Uh, one of the one liter samples and one of that one 250 milliliter sample. So again, that will have to be something that you evaluate based on your samples, uh, what you know is going to happen, and, and how you can best address that. Low recovery is probably the most common issue that we experience with solid phase extraction, and there are lots and lots of different things that can happen with that. Um, so these are the four ones that I typically um, see happening. Um, the, the, so the first one, uh, the standard itself uh, being at the proper concentration, that one is probably the easiest to identify. And it's, I honestly, even if you don't think it is, this is a good uh, way to just check to make sure that everything else is not the problem. Um, and that's just to take the um, an amount of your standard and don't even extract it. Just place it in an evaporation dish or pan and evaporate the acetone off that standard and just make sure that your standard itself is properly prepared. So once, you've, once you're sure that your standard is right, um, it's also important to know that your standard does have to be acidified. This, this also applies to your blank. 
Um, but those do have to have that acid added to them the same as, as being added to your samples. Uh, if you don't have the any acid or you don't have enough acid, um, then you're typically going to get um, a 60 to 70 percent recovery of your standard. So if that is kind of where your standard is hovering around and whatever you do, that's what you get, double check your acid. Um, I've seen cases where uh, the acids um, may be degraded or something else got spilled into it or something, and so it doesn't quite preserve down to what you think it should be. It could be, you know, three. It actually could be in the twos and just not quite be a strong enough acid. Uh, to get everything functioning properly. So it does need to be, be down below two in order for that uh, to work properly. Disc activation, we talked about that. That can be a little bit tricky in making that happen correctly. Um, you do want to make sure you remove all of your activating solvents off of there, um, but you have to replace it with water and keep that disc uh, damp uh, while you're removing the methanol. So uh, if part of it goes dry, then that can adversely affect your recovery. Uh, usually, if you're just under 50%, so somewhere in the mid to upper 40% recovery, uh, that's often indicative of a poor disc activation. Uh, and you can troubleshoot that easily by um, uh, getting a, a sample of the uh, um, pre-activated disc that we have. Uh, that's the ultra prep line is what we use. Um, and giving those a try. And if that helps and if that removes the, your recovery problems, then that obviously is where your uh, problems lie. The speed of extraction uh, can also be part of what you're looking at. Um, if you have too high a vacuum and you pull that sample through the disc or your resin bed too quickly, then you will um, uh, prevent the, the resin from extracting properly. Uh, so you do need to go at a slow controlled pace, um, somewhere around three, four, five minutes to, ex to uh, extract a one liter sample should be sufficient. Uh, so if you're going faster than that, then you do run the risk of stripping the sample through and not allowing the disc to operate properly. Also, the evaporation temperature uh, can play uh, a role in your recoveries. If, um, I know the message says, I think, up to 70 degrees, or I think it may, 1664A actually may say 70 degrees with the option of being lower. I don't remember how that's written. But 1664B says up to 70 degrees. I know that's specifically in there. Um, and we have um, discovered that lower uh, evaporation temperatures, uh, around 35 degrees, actually uh, help out in um, preserving your uh, standard recovery. Um, even, yeah, just being able to evaporate at a lower temperature will help to uh, prevent, I believe it's the hexadecane that can uh, be lost uh, in using high temperatures. All right, so there we are at the end of uh, my presentation, and we've got some time now to do questions, so I'm going to check, see, there's some hand raises. Um, not sure what the hand raise is. Hopefully that's just a question that's going to be asked. So I'm going to pull the questions out here and uh, we'll go over a few of those. Oops. And let's address them. All right, so um, the first question, where does the, where would the collection glass go? So let me back up to that picture. Here we are. And let me pull out my highlighted tool. So the collection flask goes inside this um, outer sheath. Um, there's the inner sheath is there. That's in that picture to um, hold the stable wave vessel in place. That also can be taken out. So you can either put a pan in here or a glass flask in here, but it would go inside this section there. Um, the sodium sulfate cartridge kind of helps you align. I mean, it's dead center, so it'll, it, it'll with uh, most of the flash that we've used, um, that cartridge actually goes right down inside the opening of the flask. So you'll know for sure that you've got it lined up right. 
Um, and then pans are large enough that um, you shouldn't miss that. Um, so we've got another question. Can multiple units be combined together to handle larger sample load? Yes. So again, if you look at that picture, um, let me pull my drawing tool back out. So if you look on this side, you'll see this plug here. That can be removed and just put another barb in place and you can chain uh, multiple units together um, and uh, just kind of combine them all together in one place like that. Uh, let's pull my questions back out. Um, well, maybe I won't pull those. Uh, someone's asking about stearic acid adhering to plastic surfaces. Uh, yes, it does. Um, almost all oil and grease um, will adhere to plastic surface in some manner. That's why it's very important uh, that you follow the uh, rinsing procedures as they're outlined in the method. It's, it talks very specifically about um, rinsing all surfaces that the sample has touched with hexane. So part of your um, elution process is you're adding hexane into that bottle. You shake the hexane around on the bottle to make sure that you remove anything uh, that's adhered in on the glass of your collection flask. And then you also will rinse um, all parts of the um, filter funnel, whether it's glass or plastic. You will rinse those with hexane as well to make sure that you've removed everything out of there. Um, avoid water droplets in the collection flask from aqueous sample. So it's it's all about the sodium sulfate that you're using. Or uh, 1664B gives lots of options um, in removing water. Um, it talks about the possibility of using um, uh, phase separation paper. Uh, we use sodium sulfate uh, just because that was the kind of the gold standard as far as what was um, mentioned in the method. And that's been, we found the easiest for us to work with as far as packaging and something that's um, easy to use in this manner. But um, you, you have to dry that extract somehow. Um, I've seen some labs that will collect all of the um, hexane extract for a sample together and they will actually add sodium sulfate to the extract itself and stir it around and allow the sodium sulfate to draw the water out that way. And then you would need to filter that out um, as we talked about earlier. Um, I've got a question about the cost of the equipment. I actually do not know the cost. Uh, I'm, I've said this before, I'm a tech guy. I don't uh, usually deal with the numbers as far as the, the, um, how much things cost. Give your sales rep a call and um, have them help you out on getting a quote for that, uh, the equipment. Um, there is a map on our website uh, by state showing um, who's in charge of what state and their links to their email addresses. So you can, uh, if you don't already know who your uh, sales rep is, you can find that out and uh, ask them to quote you on this and we'll help out. Uh, let's see, my lab runs really dirty wastewater samples. The consistency can be erratic due to the nature of the samples matrix it is normal. Yes, uh, that, that actually is normal. Um, oil and grease is a surface active substance. Um, so it's, Depending on the, the amount of particulates you have, it, oil and grease is a grab sample. Um, so you're just getting one shot. It is not um, an average representation of that flow stream. Uh, so uh, fluctuation um, in your stream can be a, a very normal thing. Um, you're gonna, you'd have to do enough um, analysis of your sample stream to know kind of a high and a low and set your own um, limits as far as what is normal for you. Um, and it, it's just, yeah, but yes, it can be very, very erratic. What kind of vacuum pump do you recommend? Uh, so uh, we do have a vacuum pump on our website. Uh, uh, gee, 30, 50, 30, 60, I don't know, somewhere around there. I don't remember the part number. Um, we know that works. Um, the ultimate vacuum that it draws is not as important as the amount of air that it pulls. And in this case, um, the only real thing you need to know is, does it actually, does sample go through the disc? Um, it, it's not a very elaborate, there's no, there's no very extreme requirements on this. I think just about any pump that's more powerful than an aquarium pump uh, will 
fit the bill here. And honestly, who knows, maybe even an aquarium pump will work out for you. Um, it, but you could probably, just about any pump that you've got hanging around in your lab um, will be acceptable. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, okay, we've got another one coming up. Spike recovery is also problematic. Can that be sample matrix also? Should I just spike a blank to stay in compliance? Um, Yes, that, that can be the sample matrix as well. Um, you, so as far as I know, the method requires you to run a blank, to run some sort of spiked blank. Um, I think that's, I think they call it, the, is that the ongoing precision and recovery? I don't remember exactly what they call it, but you do have to do a blank, a spiked blank, and I believe they require a sample spike as well. Um, it, they've got limits as far as what is acceptable for that sample spike, um, but um, that doesn't ever make your batch fail. A failing sample spike outside of those recovery numbers is um, it doesn't make your batch fail. It just requires you to note that your sample has matrix problems, um, and, and that's really what you're demonstrating with that uh, sample spike. Um, so if it doesn't pass the recovery, you just write it off as I've got matrix problems in this sample. And if it always happens, then that's really consistently um, demonstrating that, especially if even between duplicate samples, you have inconsistent results. Um, you're, I mean, you're just demonstrating that your sample flow is not consistent. Good way to neutralize the waste in a 10 liter carboy before dumping it, pH paper, um, uh, or honestly, um, I would often uh, put a little bit of phenolphthalein in the carboy and um, add um, uh, sodium hydroxide solution uh, just until pink, and that's usually within that's usually within the pH parameters for dumping down the sink. You would have to obviously consult your local regulations and make sure that that applies, um, but that can be helpful. Um, finding some kind of pH indicator in the appropriate range. Um, works really well. How many apparatus can be hooked together at one time and still pull sample through? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, three will work. Um, potentially more than three can work. This can uh, go along with your um, the actual amount of air that your vacuum pulls. Um, there is Still a limit, a physical size limit on the on the channel that the liquid is flowing through. Um, so, uh, and and because these are run in series, um, you you there is there is a, a physical limit on how much that can pull through at one time. And so you would just if you kept adding on to it, um, then you can um, you would see um, the the progression of the filtration as it moves down the chain. Uh, you would eventually get to the point where they wouldn't all filter at once. Uh, they would some of them would filter, and then once they emptied and added more space in the flow stream, then others would add in on there. Uh, region eight allows sulfur removal with copper strips. Yes, um, I had heard about that. Um, I didn't want to bring it up since it was it's only region eight specific as far as I know the rest of you are out of luck um, and I do not know the procedure on how to use that um, so uh, potentially you could add copper to the collection vessel I'm not sure what that procedure is and, and what the rec, uh, regulations are on doing it so uh, I, I can't really help out on that unfortunately all right. Um, I think we've got all the questions here. Oh, there we go. Now, now that I've finally gotten through them all, I figure out how to make that work. Um, any reason they can't be run in parallel? Um, no reason. I've not tried it running in parallel. I don't have a good hookup for that, but I guess if you've just got a, a manifold block to um, pull them in parallel, then that actually could um, help increase the number that you can run at one time without um, hitting that uh, hard uh, cap as far as um, the, the amount of sample that can go through at one time. 
So uh, that's definitely something that can be done. Um, how to clean. So that's a really interesting thing. That, that's an interesting topic of discussion. Uh, theoretically, cleaning is not an issue with this. Um, again, looking at, uh, hold on a second, let me get some things here, get this out of my way so I know what I'm doing. So your sample with the analyte attached to it is only ever right here in the funnel and the disk. Down here in this, in, in the extraction side where your aqueous portion, this part down here, it doesn't matter what's in here. Um, once your sample is extracted through this disk, then this doesn't, it, there is no cross contamination from one sample to another. So if you are doing your method properly, um, everything, all of your analyte is collected on this disk. And then once you move to this side, it is then all collected in your collection flask, pan, vessel, whatever you're using. So um, as long as you change the disk out between samples, which you kind of have to do because you don't know what else is on that disk from your previous sample, as long as you change your disk out and you are either using the disposable funnels or you're properly rinsing the glass funnels with hexane when you're done, then there is no cross-contamination from one sample to another. Um, if this does somehow get yucky looking and you, and you, you want to get it clean, um, it's PVC, so just hot water and soap will be just fine to wash that out. Um, you can run a little bit of a Clorox solution down through the um, channel to kind of, uh, if you get uh, any kind of growth going on in there, um, that'll clean out any algae or mold or fungus or you know, whatever might happen with acidified environmental aqueous samples. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly simple cleaning procedure, um, but yeah. Uh, what do you use to activate the disc? I heard that you mentioned to keep the disc moist. We use methanol, but must dry it before extraction. That affect the activation of the disc or the recovery. So my understanding is that the disc has to remain uh, damp with some kind of liquid um, after activation. Uh, the process that we recommend is that you pour enough methanol onto the disc to saturate it and have just a little bit of liquid visible on the surface of the disc. Let that sit there and soak for about a minute or so. And then uh, slowly pour DI water on there as you apply vacuum. So that pulls the methanol through and you keep adding DI water on top, which will keep the disc and the um, uh, resin damp so that it will remain active. Uh, my understanding has always been that if you do not keep it damp, that the disc will become partially deactivated and will not be able to extract fully and properly. Um, so that's, that's how I've always approached things. Um, but you do definitely have to replace all that methanol, get it off the, off the disc prior to um, doing elution with your hexane. All right. Other questions? Okay, I think we're kind of at the end here. Looks like um, uh, we're kind of run out. Uh, one more question on the price. Uh, check the website or contact your sales rep for a quote on the price. Uh, I, I don't have that information for you. Um, we expect to have the webinar posted uh, shortly, hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email giving you a link to where the webinar will be posted and a time frame when we expect it to be done. And uh, you can always email me directly, uh, David S at envexp.com. Uh, you can send questions in to our info inbox. You can call in and ask. However you want to get in touch with us, we'll do our best to help you out. Thank you once again, everybody, and we hope to see you again next month.